Hey witches, Marcel here. What you're about to listen to is another one of our Extended Universe episodes. This week, we bring you episode new, recorded live at the Calgary Comic and Entertainment Expo. You'll notice that throughout this episode, I make a bunch of references to slides that the attendees should be but aren't able to see. And this is because the internet hasn't actually come to Calgary yet. Uh, Neither, apparently, has cell phone reception. And so as a result, there was no way for me to display the slides without also displaying my speaker's notes. And, you know, that's just embarrassing. So what I've done is I've turned the slides into a PDF and I've put them on our website, ohwitchplease.ca, so that if you want to, you can enjoy the maximum Witch Please Live experience. Have fun. And welcome to Women Podcasting in the Potterverse, a material look at the podcast Witch Please, or But What About the Men? (laughs) That's much funnier when there's a slide that accompanies it. (laughs) My name is Marcel Cosman, and uh, I am the producer and co-host of the Harry Potter fan podcast, Witch Please. Here on my right, holding my precious child, is not my partner, but rather... Uh, I'm Neil Barnholden, guy with a film degree and a regular guest on Which Please. Uh, My voice sounds terrible from where I'm sitting. How is it for you? (laughs) Okay? Okay. All right. Uh, and I'm Trevor Chow Fraser. Hi, how are you doing? I'm uh, the erstwhile tech support and robot of her heart. Mm -hmm. And... That's it. That's, that's pretty good. That's a lot of things. And this is a hippogriff child. Yes. <laughs> Tiny hippogriff baby. So if you are wondering why it is that a panel about feminism and women in podcasting is made up by two-thirds men or three-quarters if you count our baby, uh, you are very observant and 100% correct. Uh, we totally know. Believe me, we totally know how this looks. Um, and normally, we at Witch Please have a two women for every man policy, and it is especially ironic that we are not able to uh, maintain that standard for this very panel. But both Neil and Trevor are exceptional allies and wonderful friends and all around acceptable men. And so I'm really delighted to have them here with me today. Our beloved co-host, Hannah McGregor, couldn't join us today because she is off on an exotic women-only feminist adventure in Ontario. Uh, And without her vast repertoire of literary theory and exquisite critical reading skills to ground our discussion in substance rather than uh, nonstop jokes and whimsy, um, we decided that today we would focus our efforts on introducing you to the wonderful world of uh, feminist fan podcasting instead of doing a regular critical analysis of the texts. Uh, So the talk that we're going to do today is in two parts. Uh, The first part is a thrilling discussion of our podcast, Which Please, and how we each contribute to it. And then the second part will be a how-to guide to encourage women, uh, both cis and trans women, and also genderqueer folks, uh, to encourage you to start your own fan podcasts. So part one. What and why is Witch Please? When Hannah and I started Witch Please back in February of 2015, uh, we never really intended to make a fan podcast. Uh, We really wanted to reread the books and rewatch the films and talk to each other about those experiences. Um, We decided that we would record it. We thought it would be fun. Um, And, you know, we heard that any jerk can make a podcast, so why couldn't we? Uh, We even had a few friends who said that they would listen to it, and we thought that that sounded pretty pretty exciting. Also, we're extroverts, and we like attention. (laughs) But somehow, our critical feminist analysis of Harry Potter actually struck a chord with actual real people who didn't already know us. Um, And this this was really cool for us. Before we knew it, we had an international listenership, uh, avid Twitter followers, and a community of really smart Harry Potter fans who wanted to share their ideas with us about the books and about the films. Uh, And since we started, it's become really clear to us that there's a genuine hunger out there for feminist interventions in popular culture. 
Uh, Hannah and I are both very attractive, but you can't see that on the podcast. So I want you to trust me that most of our listeners are listening because they're interested in engaging with our ideas and not just because they want to um, imagine our beautiful looks. Again, this is all very funny if there are slides that accompany it, but otherwise. We actually have an episode dedicated to explaining um, the relationship between feminism or feminist literary criticism and fandom. Um, we explore that in an episode called uh, Episode Lambda Live and Surprised at Nerd Night Yeg. Uh, this was a live episode that we did at Nerd Night Edmonton. So if you're interested in more details, we can definitely talk about it during the Q&A. Um, but if you just want to listen to that discussion, um, that episode is up on our website. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm just going to give you sort of the basics. Uh, so if you are new to feminist fandom, the important thing to take away is that reading the books and watching the movies critically, sorry, reading any books and watching any movies critically only ruins them if they're not very good to begin with, okay? So not everybody has the luxury of turning off their brains in order to enjoy something, okay? The idea of that um, is that you have a certain amount of privilege that you can sort of, um, you can like put on pause the stuff that's gonna get disturbed and offended by other things. So if uh, the part of your brain that gets uncomfortable with sexism, racism, ableism, homophobia, and transphobia can't be turned off, there's nothing actually wrong with you. It's perfectly okay to say that that's not cool. But the really amazing thing is that you can have really rich and satisfying conversations about how these texts reflect troubling issues um, and whether or not they're complicit or resistant to those issues. And that doesn't take away from a really strong and wonderful set of cultural texts. So on which, please, when we discuss the things that makes the Harry Potter uh, books and films problematic, we're not saying that these are terrible books and these are terrible movies. Um, except for the fourth movie, which is actually a terrible movie. I know some of you are like, no, that's the best movie, I know, but no, it's not, it's so bad. <laughs> it's so bad, Rewatch it, and you're like, oh man, there's nothing of substance in this movie, it's a real bummer. <laughs> anyway, the point is that problematic doesn't mean bad. Problematic means that it has some problems and I wanna talk about those problems. Those problems are worth discussing. Uh, there's also a school of thought in literary theory that criticism actually contributes to the texts. So every analysis of a book or a movie actually adds to the meaning of that book or movie. And that's really cool. So this is the kind of work that we do. Uh, we discuss the series, we call it out when it's problematic because we love it um, and because we want it to be better. So it turns out that podcasting is also a really excellent medium for critically engaging a text and building a community around it at the same time. Um, people listen, and then they tell us when we're wrong, they tell us when they think we're right, and sometimes they tell us how what we said reminds them of really good ideas that they have, and then we get to have conversations about it, and that's amazing. Okay, so. The style of which, please, I think is pretty special. Uh, right now, what I would have projected for you is this really great tweet that Neil tweeted at us about a recent episode where we have a very serious discussion of werewolfism with unceasing wolf howls in the background. Every time we mention the name Lupin, there's a howl in the background. And it's really funny, if I do say so myself. As the person who puts together the sound effects, it's quite funny. Um, so. <laughs> So Hannah, who is not able to be here with us today, as I mentioned, she writes our scripts. Most of our conversations, or sorry, let me be clear, all of our conversations are unscripted and unrehearsed, uh, but what Hannah does is she prepares the intros, the transitions, the credits, the thank yous for each episode, and she ensures that there's some kind of um, ironic or apropos theme to structure them. And so breaking up our discussions into segments ensures that the episodes have a reliable flow. And for the most part, it helps to keep us focused, though not always. <laughs> um, also, Hannah is very smart and has an exceptional uh, ability to recall literary history, um, genre, and theory. And so often what I tell people is that she provides the content, whereas I provide the structure. How's that? 
This is uh, our Earthworld tech support actually tech supporting. <laughs> live, <laughs> cool. live. Live, live for you. Um, so Neil, why don't you tell us what you do with Witch Please? Uh, as a regular guest on the show, essentially, um, I find out from Marcel and Hannah when the episode's going to be recorded and what it's going to be about. And uh, because I'm an idiot, I do do research, um, which if you've been listening to the show, you know did not go so well for me uh, most recently <laughs> about the episodes. I had to go back and correct myself, which is why having a conversation is actually probably a much better way to do the podcast. I mean, don't don't discredit the amount of conversations you do have with us. Those are also great. Th that's also true. But uh, <laughs> essentially, I show up having done the preparation uh, that you indicate to me uh, is the thing that you're going to be talking about. So mm -hmm. I'm on the same page, sometimes literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Trevor, mm -hmm. what do you do? <clears throat> I'm the tech support. And so... Some people thought I was the producer at first, and I'm not. So don't let that be your idea. Marcel does all of the actual <laughs> radio production. I just help set up the website and show them how the equipment works at first. And if something's going wrong, I'll get some frantic tweets, and I'll go fix something. Uh, and I take care of the baby when they're busy getting drunk and recording. <laughs> <laughs> That's Hannah and Neil, not me. <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, wow, okay, cool, getting honest. <clears throat> Just kidding. So, as Trevor mentioned, the production is my job, uh, and so what that means is that I edit the audio, I add in the sound effects, which are very important to me, I organize the segments, um, and uh, generally I work to ensure that what we're saying matches up with what we mean. And so sometimes when you're having a conversation uh, with a friend or with a colleague, um, and you both know what you mean, uh, it sometimes doesn't always come across, sometimes your politics are confusing when they're taken out of context. So often what I find myself doing is making sure that the way in which we have said the thing that we are saying clearly represents what we mean to say. Um, I can't actually think of a very good example for this right now, but it's, Neil put it really well when he described it as a kind of policing of your own politics, and essentially uh, what you're doing is you're just making sure that you don't sound like you're making fun of something that you're actually talking about seriously but laughing uncomfortably about. Does that make sense? Because like sometimes if you like hear somebody laughing about something and you think that they're being flippant, they're actually just really uncomfortable, and that's how they express their discomfort. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. That makes sense, right? Anyway. Um, and here's the thing about the sound effects. I just use them brazenly. Like, use sound effects. People really like it. I don't know. <laughs> One really important thing to say is that um, I rarely edit out our laughter. We all here uh, live in a society where uh, the number one cause of death among pregnant women is murder. Uh, the suicide rates for trans and genderqueer youth are through the roof. Uh, the murders and disappearances of indigenous women and girls is so commonplace that it is uh, a frequent refrain for people to publicly say, am I next, in order to gain attention to this tragedy. So the sound of women laughing is extremely political. Our joy is political. And women and genderqueer people podcasting is political. So I really want to emphasize that while it sounds like we're having a lot of fun, and we are, what we're doing is actually a really radical political feminist act, and it's really important. It's also a lot of work, but it's super fun, and it's pretty easy. And so this is gonna take us into the second section of our talk, uh, which is about how to make a podcast. So, um, by now you may be wondering if I only invited these two handsome men here with me to uh, license my misandry, but that is not entirely the case. Um, they are going to uh, join me in explaining how and why we make podcasts, the different ways and the different podcasts that they make. And uh, the other sort of key thing to this section is that um, we want to address the fact that women experience disproportionate barriers to access when it comes to podcasting, um, which is to say that uh, podcasting should be really easy and equal uh, equal to all people to do, um, but uh, women more than men um, experience these uh, things that hold them back from it. So we're gonna we're gonna try to tackle these. Um, so while our advice is not specific to women, we want 
our women and genderqueer listeners to know that we are specifically talking to you. So uh, my first podcast was Witch Please, and I've already sort of talked about what I do with that, so I won't go, I won't rehash that. Um, but if Neil and Trevor now, if you would like to talk about what brought you to podcasting. Uh, are, are you going to talk about how Witch Please developed, though, the, the history mm, of it? Do you want me to? I can. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you should. Okay. All right. Well, if you insist. It started out as a friend project. That's the thing that Hannah and I describe it as. Um, we, we decided that we wanted to reread the books and rewatch the movies and talk about it. And so in doing that, we thought um, this would be a really cool way to um, sort of keep track and keep record of these conversations that we were having. Um, but yeah, friend project is, the, is definitely the way that we describe it. Yeah, no, that absolutely answers my question. Okay. First question. Uh, okay. As for how I came to podcasting, uh, you almost certainly do not know about this, but I had a How I Met Your Mother-centric podcast about two years ago. And it developed because uh, I and a friend, uh, after we, we would watch the show regularly, and after each episode, we would have these long, kind of involved discussions about it. And at a certain point, we thought it would be fun uh, to turn those into a podcast format. So I really agree with Marcel that, um, or I agree, but I had a parallel experience where it was sort of an act of friendship or something that I was doing with a friend uh, as part of our friendship that then became a podcast. So the podcast really was uh, our friendship in podcast form, if you want to think of it in kind of somewhat corny but absolutely true terms. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, and true. So I am part of an award-winning podcast called Terra Informa, which probably also you've never heard of. <laughs> but it's an environmental news show based in Edmonton, and we are on uh, community radio across Canada. And so my understanding is that podcasts, as my friend Rosa says, are just PVR'd radio. So I just <laughs> think of it as radio. And uh, I got into it uh, in Guelph when I joined the campus community radio station there, mostly just as a way to meet people. Get We just moved to Guelph, uh, and I just wanted to join a community, and it was a very welcoming one. So I made friends. It's not something that started off with friends, but it's definitely focused around friendship as well. This is really sweet. Yay. <laughs> friendship. <laughs> cool. That's amazing. Um, so, oh, yes, please. <laughs> Um, so there are, there are lots of barriers to access when it comes to podcasting, but the three key ones that we decided to look at um, and talk about today are money, technology, and misogyny. Um, and the saddest thing is that you guys are not going to see the really sweet gifts that I had for this. But you know what? That's okay. That doesn't matter. Actually, imagine maybe you them. You can yeah, you can imagine them. Website. I can post great. them on the website. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, turn it over to Neil to talk about money. Um, there was going to be a gif of Peggy Olson from I'm Mad gonna, Men just counting a fat stack of money. Counting <laughs> the fat stack of money. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to speak to my own experience. When I first uh, started a podcast, oh. I was absolutely clear about the fact that I did not want it to cost any money whatsoever, uh, which seemed daunting at first, but I sort of gradually realized how to put it together. Um, I would like to say that there are, if you don't know this, there are quite a lot of resources online for free that will explain different ways that you can do a podcast, um, and I had that experience. Uh, I think certainly it's difficult to say that you could make a podcast with no amount of money being spent ever at any point. So for example, I recorded that podcast entirely on this phone, uh, but I had to have a phone before that point. Um, we were talking about this ahead of time, and some public library systems have recording equipment that they will let you use for free, so that's something that's fairly important. Um, and in terms of putting it online and hosting it, there are services such as the Internet Archive, uh, archive.org, which will host sound files uh, that you upload onto the Internet, and that is all absolutely free. As I say, though, you do sort of need to have some access to technology in order to do that. Uh, and maybe that's a good transition uh, into Trevor, talking about the idea of technology as a barrier to access. Well, Neil, I'm wondering, did you both have phones? 
You, you and Brianna? Actually, no. Uh, this is worth pointing out. We only had one phone, so we tried to use it in various ways. We tried to set it equidistant between our two mouths as we spoke. Uh, we tried to pass it back and forth. There are certain technological things that maybe Trevor can speak to. So the phone only has one audio track, for example, and it's not keyed to anyone's particular distance that they're speaking at. But no, we only used one phone. And uh, no one ever complained about the quality of the recording. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> so being in a, a campus community radio station, you get access to really high quality equipment, which is cool, and it's free. All you have to do is volunteer there. So I've got experience on both ends of the, of the spectrum, from using my phone to do an interview to using an like, expensive studio microphone. And the quality is not a big deal. Uh, it's fun to have really high quality equipment to work with, but when you're listening to it in your car or walking down the street um, and you're streaming an MP3, like, the listener doesn't really notice the difference. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is how you use it. So if you have your microphone, you want the podcast to be like a private conversation with the listener. That's the kind of intimacy that the listener appreciates. Right? So yeah. just make sure that the microphone is like close to your mouth. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you, you could have both have your own phone and you're just recording each other or yourself like that? That never occurred to me <laughs> at all. <laughs> uh, the other thing you were probably doing this is to make sure that you're in a quiet location. If you have carpets or curtains on the windows, then that helps muffle the sound. Uh, the worst place to do something with radio is a cafe, which is quite a popular place to meet people and do interviews. But cafes have clangy dishes, and the cappuccino machine goes in the middle of a really important thing that someone's saying. So yeah, finding the right space and then keeping the equipment close, I think that's the most important thing. If you did want to buy some equipment, like um, for, for which please, we do have a microphone, and it costs about $100. Um, uh, we also have a dedicated audio recorder. and. If you were going to invest any money in your podcast, I think this is where it would be useful. The baby agrees. <laughs> <laughs> the main thing is it's not necessarily higher quality. You will find that there's less hiss in the background when you have an actual dedicated audio recorder. Um, the main thing is that it's really easy to use. So there's like a dedicated record and not record button. With your phone, sometimes it goes mm -hmm. dark and then you're not sure if it's recording or not. Mm -hmm. And you're, always, you're just always stressed. And sometimes you get to have like this really intimate two-hour conversation with your hero, Jonathan Goldstein. This is a true story. <laughs> and you get to the end of it, and you realize that your recorder, which was on your phone, shut off after 10 minutes. <gasps> and then you make all kinds of awkward excuses and apologies, and it's really terrible. So, so That happened so, to me. Yeah. That's the worst. So using a phone is, is fine, but I would invest in a recorder if you can, or you can go to your campus community radio station and sign one out for free. CJSW here in Calgary is an excellent radio station. Mm -hmm. I was also going to talk about editing, oh. because Marcel said editing is very important. Uh, Neil actually used something oh. which is completely free and open source. Yeah, I used the yeah. software Audacity. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, uh, it's completely free. It's also very intuitive to use. Uh, it has a great... Um, uh, kind of forum and uh, resources online if you're not sure about how to use it. It's completely free and it works quite well for this kind of thing, for just very simple audio editing, which is the only kind that I know how to do at all. Again, I can't downplay how little I know about podcasting. And yet I had a podcast. So. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's important to do some editing no matter what. You'll often find things which are called podcasts and they're just like someone put their phone in front of a lecture hall and then posted it online. To me, like having a little bit of editing and improving the sound quality makes it much more engaging for the listener. Um, if you think about, again, where people listen to podcasts, it's in their car, it's walking down the street. So you want to really bring up the volume and compress it so that people can hear the voices clearly cutting through the sounds of horns and <laughs> traffic and stuff. Mm. So a little bit of editing is important, and you can do it for free uh, using Audacity. Um, again, for which, please, we use uh, Adobe Audition. So if you have a graphic design suite already, you can use that. If you have a Macintosh computer, you can use GarageBand. It's made for music, but you can use it to make a podcast. 
Also, Marcel, where do you get your sound effects? I get all of my sound effects from freesound.org. <laughs> As you can imagine, they're free. Um, and what I do is I just search for, um, Google search for like royalty free sounds and there are, there are sites for that. Um, and usually what you find is um, some of them are like Creative Commons licenses. So you just have to put a source at the end or like a source on the um, audio file or something like that so that people can link to it. But yeah, there are tons of ways to get like really hilarious and wonderful sound effects for free. And you can get music for free too, which is probably the harder thing. Um, I mean, anyone could go out in their backyard and record an owl hooting <laughs> in the tree, right? What are you saying about my owl sounds? <laughs> <laughs> but getting a theme song is hard. So if you go to freemusicarchive.org, there's just thousands and thousands of music uh, of songs. Um, some of it is quite good, some of it's okay. <laughs> So you, you can spend a lot of time there listening to music. The last part of a podcast, which is technology oriented, which I was asked to talk about, is uh, publishing. So for Which Please, um, I already do websites. So Which Please is hosted on our server. Um, it's really, it's, it's, it's possible to have a podcast which is completely free, but not, as far as I know, to have it with an RSS feed so that you can put it in iTunes. Is that mm. true? That was my experience, yeah. We were unable to have that happen. So if you want it in iTunes, um, which is cool, because then you can be on the upcoming hot, hot what is it, the hot new, 100? Yeah, I think it was new and noteworthy. I don't yeah. think it was a hot 100. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be new and noteworthy if you get an iTunes, like which pleads it. Um, but to do that, you'll have to spend um, $40 a year for WordPress to host audio or you can spend about $7 a month to host your own website. Um, you can use Libsyn, which is another paid host. But if you, do want, if you want to do it completely free, what did you do? Yeah. Oh, I used the Internet Archive. I used archive.org, which you might think of as a repository of things, but it's also a place where you can put things on the Internet. So, yeah. 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 Um, and it, I would again encourage you to go to CGSW or whatever campus community radio station ha is around you um, because they will A, send out your music on the radio or send out your podcast on the radio. Um, they'll probably archive it on their own website. And you can also then add it to the NCRA exchange, which is the national campus community radio exchange. And then any radio station in Canada could play your show. Um, and it's a really great way to spread your Spread your voices, which is the whole point of this, is getting women and genderqueer people's voices heard. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, so I guess one of the other things I want to point out that I think is so cool um, about uh, what Neil and Trevor were just talking about is also the way in which um, having a community around you and like asking for help from your friends is also a really great way to increase your resources. So like. Because Trevor was already hosting websites, um, he was willing to host our website um, so that we could, without having to pay any additional money, um, get an RSS feed. And uh, Neil's film degree was extremely useful in changing the nature of our discussions about the film. <laughs> All of a sudden, we were able to talk about them like films <laughs> instead of just close reading them like books, which is very cute. Anyway, my point being, Ask the friends around you to help you. It's such a good idea. Um, OK, so then the last, the third and final barrier to access that I want to talk about is, uh, is misogyny, which, which comes in many forms. And it's a very real and it's a very powerful barrier because this is the thing that prevents people from even trying, right? So it's not like, oh, I don't have a very good microphone, so I'm not going to make a good podcast. It's like, oh, I'm afraid that people are going to call me stupid or like tell me that my ideas are dumb or like make fun of me on the internet or harass me on the internet. So the only way that something as powerful as misogyny can be overcome is by having a critical mass of underrepresented voices speaking despite the fact that we are nervous or afraid to speak. Um, the fact is that women's voices are routinely criticized. Uh, so in addition to being interrupted constantly, being talked over, being called emotional or hysterical, um, or being told that our needs and wants and uh, opinions are special interest, uh, the way that we speak is also always under fire. Um, so a lot of you have probably heard about uptalk. 
Uptalk is a way of making sure that the person you're talking to knows that you haven't finished your sentence yet. So often when you're talking and the middle of your sentence or the middle of your point, if you're telling a story, will kind of go up like that. Um, that's usually a way of uh, subconsciously saying, I'm still talking, please don't interrupt me right now. Um, and Parents hate it. Parents do hate it because <laughs> parents hate it when their teenagers are talking. I remember, <laughs> I was a teenager. I'm gonna have one soon in like, 13 years or whatever. Um, and then vocal fry, which has also been in the, uh, in the media a lot lately. Vocal fry is the result of lowering our voices to combat uptalk. So we're told that uptalk is back, and so then we start to lower our voices intentionally so that the end of our sentences are always pretty low. And then we get this kind of gravelly sound. I have it. You might be able to hear it. Um, and we do this so that we don't uptalk and so that we don't come across as shrill or nagging, but then people tell us that vocal fry is bad. Listen, there's nothing wrong with the way that you speak, okay? The way that you speak is perfectly awesome. When someone critiques the quality of your voice, it's because they don't wanna hear what you have to say and it is not because there's anything wrong with the sound of your voice. But criticism like this contributes to the trivialization and the marginalization of our voices but we have important things to say. So this is why we're here encouraging you to start your podcast, to get a community together, do it with friends. Have like minimal expectations. Be really excited if two people listen to your podcast. Just make it for you. Don't worry about the internet. The internet is its own thing and it'll, it'll come later. It'll like catch on eventually. Um, and like don't worry about really high quality, high budget podcasts, like especially the ones with women hosts, like Serial and Invisibilia. Both Serial and Invisibilia are connected to Radio Lab and This American Life. So they both come from established podcasts with tons of money behind them. Just have fun. Just make something that's fun and make it for you. That's what Neil and his friend Brianna did. That's what Hannah and I, and then Neil and Trevor as a community did. We just made it for us and we made it for fun. Yeah, yeah, you are people whose bodies and whose identities have been deemed less worthy, um, and your voices are extremely important, your joy is important, your laughter is a political act, make a podcast about anything. So now that the official spiel is over, we're gonna open it up to questions, and we really wanna encourage you, um, we know that this is supposed to be a Harry Potter conversation. So please, if you, if you want to talk about Harry Potter, we're happy to talk about Harry Potter. We're happy to talk about feminism and literary criticism. We're happy to talk about podcasting and give you more details or tell more hilarious stories about our ridiculous antics. So anything you want. Yeah, so let's open it up. Yes. Oh, <laughs> it's very sad. I know. I forgot that the questions aren't themselves gonna get recorded. So the first question was um, about why we don't like the fourth movie. What we discovered when we rewatched the movie is that it's almost like the director took sort of key scenes, all the important scenes from the book, and then sort of jammed them into a movie without any kind of coherent narrative. So if you haven't read the book and you watch the movie, you get a lot of like, peaked feelings, but you don't necessarily get like a clear story. Do you want to talk a little bit more about this, Neil? Because you're the guy with a film degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, if you do listen to our podcast about it, we, we sort of came to realize that the things we liked about the movie were all references to our experience reading the book, mm -hmm. and that we'd find that. And um, we, we had inter interesting interactions with our fans about uh, Cedric Diggory's death, actually, that, of <laughs> course, it's, it's so affecting, and it's so upsetting, and it's so terrible. But then we sort of realized that we were always thinking about the book when that happens. Mm -hmm. So that might be a bit more of a personal description, but we found it to not hold together super well as a movie. Yeah. It, like, it was my favorite movie of all of them until, until the, the sixth and seventh movies, sixth, seventh, and eighth movies came out. But when we rewatched it, I was like, oh, it's not, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. The second question 
was um, what is the what is the key thing that we want um, uh, young women to take away when it comes to feminism and Harry Potter or literature I guess what I would say is that the fandoms can be really incredible places to take um, things that you love but aren't um, but aren't representing your needs and turn them into something that is more for you. So one of the really cool things that I have learned about fandom is that fandom and literary criticism are pretty much the same thing, except that one of them takes place at a university or a college, and the other one takes place um, between friends or on the internet or in conventions like, like the expo. But essentially what you're doing is the same thing. You're taking the information that um, a book or a movie or a set of stories or whatever has, and then you're sort of transforming it. You're changing it by contributing your own ideas to it. Um, and so, in fandom, you can sort of take something like Harry Potter, which has, which is friend, we describe it as being friendly towards feminism, but not in and of itself a feminist text. And then you can, through fandom, you can make the stories more yours. So one, I think, really amazing example is the, um, the fandom that reads Hermione as being a black character. I think it is so incredible and so important and necessary to see strong, young, powerful female characters as women of color and not just always defaulting to white women. I think that that's really boring and really limiting. Um, yeah, and it's fandom that does that. Most of the time it's not our beloved authors or our beloved movie makers um, who do that work. It's the fandom that does that work. The fandom says, this character doesn't need to be white, so let's make it better. I think a really good example of that is, uh, like you said, you really like Lord of the Rings. And so um, I read Lord of the Rings when I was like seven or something stupid like that. Like <laughs> I did not absorb any of it. <laughs> but then I grew up and I was like, oh yeah, Lord of the Rings, it's awesome. When the movies came out, um, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Uh, and I loved the movies. And I know that at the time there were all these, well, before, it, before the first movie came out, there was a lot of people wondering like, how authentic is it gonna be? How close to the books will it be? And people really value the author's vision in a lot of these things, prioritize the author's vision. And that's kind of silly. If you look at some of the best characters in the Lord of the Rings movies, they're women, and they did not exist in the books. And they're definitely an improvement on, on the Lord of the Rings story. And the story is still a good story, but um, through like Peter Jackson and Ensemble's um, fandom, they, they improved it. Yeah, like the like the novel isn't, or the story isn't ruined by Arwen taking Harry to Rivendell, Harry? like, or Harry sorry, Harry. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be. <laughs> you know what I mean. Actually, it sure wouldn't be. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, sorry. There are, are there other questions? <laughs> uh, oh my goodness. Uh, 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 yes, you here at the right? Yes. Okay. The first is how long does it take you to put together a podcast? We generally record for, this is a great question. Right, okay, how long does it take to put together an episode? We generally record, oh God, we usually record for about two hours because we, have, we think we're so funny. And then the editing, um, it used to take me, it used to take me about like 20 hours to edit a single episode, which sounds ridiculous, uh, and it is. I think I'm better. I think it now takes me about 12 to 15 hours. Um, but again, you don't have to edit as thoroughly as I do. You can be more comfortable with the sound of your ah, uh, and if you are like me and take a long time to get to your point, um, you just edit all that stuff out. But if you're okay with people hearing how long it takes you to get to your point, you can just leave that in. It takes you like a third of the time to edit, yeah. Is that the um, second oh. question? What? I was going to say, uh, I didn't really say this in my part, my bit, but uh, I was asked to talk about technology. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing about technology is it doesn't really matter. It's, it's the planning and like the time yeah. that Marcel puts into the podcast is, is the real work that makes it a good quality podcast. Um, Thanks, so, like, Trevor. <laughs> 
Uh, there's a really good graphic novel, comic, uh, about NPR, uh, about This American Life, um, written by Jessica Abel. And if you, if you check that out, it tells you how they make their shows. And they have kind of the same equipment that you can have access to. The thing that they do is they spend like three months on a 10 minute story. They, mm -hmm. they spend so much time researching, writing, rehearsing, and that's what makes it really high quality. Mm -hmm. We can do the same stuff, you know? Yeah, but that's not our job, so we don't. It's not our job. <laughs> cool. But we can do a good job. So we have three minutes left. Uh, let's try to squeeze three questions okay. in. Is that okay? What were you going to say? Oh, you she had a second, had a second question, but she's... Okay, okay. Yeah, yes, sorry. at the back. Okay, so the question is, what's our favorite... Um, did you say feminist action or female action? Or does female. female action. Okay. My The thing that gave me chills was when I read the book and um, uh, Bellatrix is attacking Ginny and Mrs. Ugh. Weasley steps in and <laughs> swear word warning alert. And she says, not my daughter, you bitch. <gasps> I just got chills again. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th that's what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yes, question. There is, there is something that is very interesting about the fourth movie and the first movie. OK. If you take a look at the first movie, you see the fall of London. Yes. And then in the fourth movie, he you're very right. Okay, that's a very good point. So the so the comment was that the f the first movie and the fourth movie really do fit together in a kind of narrative, right? With the the fall of Voldemort in the first movie and then the rise of Voldemort in the fourth. So we don't have time for any more questions, but I'm so sorry. But what I really want to encourage you to do is join us at the Kensington Pub at 6:30 for a Witch Please Meetup, where we can have more conversations about our favorite and least favorite and most hysterical things about Harry Potter. Thank you all so much for coming. You can also tweet at Witch Please. <gasps> please do. At... Yeah, we're on the internet. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, Witch Please at ohwitchplease.ca is our website. Nope, sorry, I don't know what I'm saying. It's on the screen. <laughs> We run out of time. Twitter, Thank you all Twitter. so much for being here. Be on Twitter. We're on Twitter. We love Twitter. Join us on Twitter. Okay. Thanks Thank so you much. all so much. <laughs> Whew, things really went off the rails there when we ran out of time. Anyway, uh, tune in next fortnight for a regular episode, the second third of our discussion of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. But until then, later, witches. <laughs>